For this bike build, I've had to hire some security as I'm about to build one of the most sought after retro trials bikes there is. Honestly though, it's the no job the cute thief can't do. He's even a good negotiator as he's twisted my arm and persuaded me that he needs a higher quality treat if he's going to have to work more hours. I'm no slave driver, so I got him some nice chimkin chunks. But you know what? These are actually pretty tasty. Sorry cute security, these are my treats now. Remind me not to make the cute thief angry. He's chucked a box on the floor and handed in his jacket, badge and gun. I was only teasing. Let's see if the content survived though. Hopefully, by the time I've built this bike, it'll have calmed down a bit. Right, I'm sure you guys have seen the thumbnail, but let's see what the cat dragged in. Well, shiver me timbers, it's a Pace RC250T. This was literally a dream frame for me in the late 90s and early 2000s. Chris Akrig rode for Pace back then, and it made for a very stylish combo. Later, the Charles Kings rode these red versions, and I always thought their bikes were extremely jewel worthy. Pace frames were made in my home county of Yorkshire, and were famous for using square tubing. They'd mill the outside of the tubes to save weight, as they weren't internally butted like usual tubing. This increases their unique look. There really wasn't anything else like them. This Charles model had a hefty brace up near the head tube too, which made it stand out even more. And check out that head tube badge. They don't make them like that anymore. But the weight weenie in me might be a little glad they don't. Despite extra bracing on the chainstays, this frame doesn't use any CNC'd yokes. Sadly, the result is a frame that despite looking tough, was actually notoriously weak. And it's one reason why these frames are pretty rare these days. Cracking a chainstay weld wasn't unusual. No bracing around the dedicated Magura mounts either. And this might make the brake a bit spongy. I do like Pace's replaceable dropouts though. And this frame also has a unique seat clamp design too, but we'll come back to that later. Despite these frames not being the strongest, this one's in pretty decent condition with no dents or big scrapes. It's not pristine though and does have some paint chips. A lot of them have been touched up and are harder to see. But yeah, I'm stoked to have finally gotten hold of such a cool frame. I know a lot of you have requested this, so let's jump into the build and see if the full bike lives up to expectations. Oh, but first, if you're interested, the frame weighs a nice round 1,941 grams, which is about the same weight as an inspired frame, or four 500 gram bags of pebbles. Tradition dictates that we start with a headset first and the cute thief was told not to come back with anything but the best, and he didn't disappoint. Chris King headsets are things of legend. I once heard one swam the Pacific unsupported and had to fight off five great whites and a stingray. Luckily for this leg end, it only has to rotate smoothly on the front of a bike. Easy. And because it's a posh bike, it gets some posh grease too. And that, of course, also means I have to bring out the posh tools. It wasn't just frames that Pace made, they also made forks too. And I do mean forks with an S because they did more than one model. This was their later trial specific fork, and these are possibly even rarer than the frames, as they also weren't the strongest things out there. They did a couple of versions, with this being the V-brake model. Pace liked putting mounts on the rear of forks, and this is no exception. I think it's a very nice looking fork, and would suit the frame perfectly. But, on the other hand, this RC31 carbon fork is definitely pimper. This isn't really designed for trials, however it didn't stop Wanio charging full speed into rocks and walls way back in the day, and despite some flex, they seem to cope pretty well. My calibrated arms say that this fork is about as stiff as a winter gale blown down from the Arctic. As a bonus, 
this has the desirable bolt-on V-brake adapters too, which is cool as I can choose to have them on the front or back of the legs. The world is my mollusk. Weight-wise, the Charles version with its alloy legs and steel steerer comes in at 906 of them grams. Again, about the weight of an inspired fork. With its carbon legs and alloy steerer, there's a nice weight saving with the RC31. That, and it being a bit more showy-offy, is enough reason for me to choose this fork to fit today. What do you think? Is it the right choice? Up next, I have an extremely first world issue with the cockpit setup. I have this lovely race face sys stem, stem, which was a popular choice for this era bike. I really like the lack of pinch bolts to hit my knees on. These older frames were quite short, and this would happen fairly often. I don't know why it works, but it just does. On the other hand, this is a little rarer. A UK made X-Lite fly stem. This has the same advantage of no steerer bolts, but it has the added bonus of square tubing with machine butting like the frame. Could this be a match made in Glasgow? It's a little more unorthodox, but it could be really cool. But I'm gonna use this. Okay, now hear me out. Firstly, Brissa or Brysa or Breezer, however you say it, was a Charles brand from the very early 2000s. They did frames, forks, and a bar and stem. This is even rarer than the X-Lite stem, and I've only ever seen one for sale in the last decade. Fortunately, the cute thief has some good contacts. Rarity isn't the only reason why I want to use this. Danny Holroyd used to ride for Brissa before moving to Pace, and for a little while ran their red Pace frames with this silver stem. Donny McCuskill also had a red Pace with Bryce's stem, possibly also influenced by Holroyd, so this combo means quite a lot to me. I was a bit sad not to use an X-Lite product though, but fortunately this top cap makes me feel a bit better. With that announcement done, I can show you this matching Brisa bar. It's actually a good job I have this, as the stem is an odd 28.6mm clamp. Azonic and Tioga also tried to make this clamp size a thing 20 years ago, but it never really took off. This wasn't the easiest part to play, but I think this has something to do with it. I first thought these were the thickest wall bars I'd ever seen, but now I'm wondering if something is shoved in there. I mean, we've all thought about it. I should also probably talk about the bar shape. Long before flat bars were popular for downhill, trials have been using them for years. I guess it's just easier and cheaper to make. That's why the stem is longer and higher, to make up for the lack of height in the bar itself. It also allows you to choose your preferred sweeps, tilted back for a more relaxed ride and further forward for better back wheel control. Or, of course, upside down if you're a complete nutter. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I like it. I always think bikes with bars like this look happy. Actually, you know what? I've changed my mind about the fork. I do this sometimes. I think I want one thing, but actually I'm better off with the original option. The Charles Kings and Donnie McCuskill both used the Charles fork, and after all those member berries with the bar and stem, I'd rather the bike be a little closer to how they had theirs. I can hear all the sighs of relief from here. There's no star nut in this fork though, so I'll use this expander plug instead. Hmm, this shouldn't keep spinning like this. Turns out the plug is just pulling out the steerer. I'll have to find another solution. Enter exhibit D, a threaded tube with a small wedge on one end. Actually, this is a slightly modified inspired headlock. This fork has a curved bottom at the lower steerer opening, which means a normal flat plug wouldn't look nice. Fortunately, this fork has a step inside the lower steerer that a small wedge locks into nicely, 
keeping everything looking much neater. Now for the front circle, or the front circle I would have used if this hadn't happened. And that's not just any buckle bucko, that's the death of a hub. And apparently this happens every time someone does a bitch crank 180, so for the love of god, cut it out! It's a real shame too, as this was once a pretty sweet Hope Tide Glide mono. Not the rarest, but now a little bit rarer. The rim can live another day, but with this being a 36 hole wheel, I don't have any 36 hole hubs to replace it. Another shame, as this Mavic X517 ceramic would have had people salivating, or more. I still remember doing a comp, on my Brysa actually, with a 521 ceramic and normal black pads, and it working pretty well even in the rain. I was young and thick though, so I'm sure I wouldn't be as impressed these days. This rib was pretty narrow too, not the end of the world on a bike like this, but a little wider never hurt. But making it heavy and might, this is such a light wheel. But not all is lost, the cute thief anticipated at least one bitch crank 180, so provided a spare wheel just in case. And actually, this wheel might be a better match as it has a paste carbon hub. To give this a fighting chance, I've built it two cross rather than radial. The last wheel survived a while, actually only snapping when deflating a tyre, but radial is very stressful on flanges. The rim is an old Alex DM24. It's not the lightest or most pimp, but it was a front rim that was used, as it's fairly wide, and actually this will be a nice match for the rear rim that you'll see shortly. I'm trying to keep this bike as period correct as possible, so I'm going to reuse the original rim tape this rim had before I built the wheel. Now it's ready for some rubber, and of course this bike needs at least one Redwald IRC tyre. Redwald IRC tyres really were iconic in trials. Every other bike was fitted with them. This Mythos XC was a popular front tyre as it was smaller and lighter, but IRC did make a trial specific tyre too that people ran front and rear, but sadly they're so rare that the cute thief couldn't even find a set. El Gato Deceptiona. Just like my body, these sidewalls don't age very well, and it's common to see them faded or frayed. This tyre isn't perfect, but it's pretty decent, and that's good enough. I'm not going to use my easy fit technique today, a bit of manual labour never hurt anyone. But that's only because I want to share some latex with you. Like the rim tape, I want to keep this bike period correct where possible, so I'm using an inner tube I genuinely used back in the early 2000s, an Air B latex one. This is bringing back some memories. I forgot they came covered in a suspicious white powder. It's either some kind of smuggling job or it's baby powder. And I mean powder to stop babies sticking to each other, not powder made from babies. I'm suddenly transported straight back to my youth. These tubes are fairly light, but supposedly latex was harder to puncture due to it being more stretchy than normal tubes. All I remember is that if you do destroy it, it makes fantastic elastic for catapults. The wheel's nearly finished, there's no disc needed, but I do require a quick release, and I'm sure there's a joke to be made there somewhere. But while you think that one over, check this out! Another x -Lite product. This is their QR, and it has a neat security feature where you can remove the lever to make it harder for people to steal your wheel. Pretty cool, huh? So, with the front circle done, let's draw another. Yep, I'm sure you recognise that sound. A particularly aggressive sounding Chris King hub. This is a discotech model. It had a removable disc mount and you could swap it for different styles for different rotors, or just not run it at all to save weight. It's not just the hub that's cool though. This X-Lite Fatso rim is also pretty sweet. This is very similar to the front rim, but even wider. At 38mm outer 
This was pretty much as wide as most frames could fit between the brakes, but a wider rim definitely helped in riding natural stuff. The only bad thing is that these are very heavy. I didn't want to ruin a cool retro part, but it was common for riders to drill big holes in these rims to save weight, and I don't blame them. Fortunately, this rim also came with original rim tape, and also, fortunately, it's still sticky enough to be reused. So, on it goes. You'll be over the moon to find out I'm using a matching red IRC tyre. Well, almost matching. This is the IRC Cujo. Again, a trial specific IRC Elgato would have been the cherry on top, but the Cujo is still very cool. In fact, this tyre has a lot of meaning for me, as the Cujo tyre was the first ever bike part upgrade I ever purchased. This one is a little worn down, and the rubber feels very hard, but I'm not going for perfection. As long as it's good enough, I accept what Elgato brings. This is a pretty beefy tyre, and it's certainly not going to help with the weight of the rear wheel. It is great for puncture protection though. To help save some weight, or make it heavier depending on how you view it, I'm fitting this retro Hutchinson latex downhill tube. A downhill tube might be overkill, but this latex version is lighter than the equivalent rubber downhill tube, and potentially even more puncture proof. I used these tubes when they were more common, and I really like them, so I'm stoked to have another one for this bike. But the question on everyone's lips is whether I can get this combo fitted without tyre levers. Well, a combination of my partially arthritic but persistent thumbs and my cooling bald spot, I did manage to get this usually tricky combo on by hand. That deserves a like and subscribe if ever I saw it. Now, it just needs a couple of accessories before I can fit it. Starting with this 18 tooth Chris King sprocket. Now, obviously I need to add some spaces to make up the space. I was hoping for something pimp, maybe carbon, but no. I've got this mess instead. Though I have to admit, this is what a lot of riders used if they weren't using multiple gears. They'd go to their local bike shop and ask for any cassettes they were throwing out. They'd then take them apart and harvest the spaces from between the cogs. It ain't pretty, but it works. I've no idea what my chain line is, so I'm gonna guess and I'll swap it later if needed. A matching X-Lite quick release finishes the wheel off nicely, and with it fitted, the bike is starting to look amazing already. Let's move swiftly onto the arse of the bike and the FSA ISIS bracket. Boy, that name aged badly, didn't it? I don't know too much about this. I don't think it's titanium, despite the gold coating, but we can pretend it is. Joining ISIS are these race face cranks, and now I'm probably on the FBI watch list. These were often the crank of choice due to their decent strength. It was usually a choice between these and Middleburns. It would have been cool to have another British brand involved, but the cat seems to be a fan of Canada for some reason. We are keeping it British with the chainring though, with another pace product. As far as chainrings go, it's quite clever. The teeth are offset, and there's two sets of mounting holes designed to be used on opposing sides. This gives you a little bit of adjustment of the chain line. Pay seem really good at adding clever little things like this in their products. Now, silly me thought I could fit the cranks and then surprise you with a snappy bash fitting, but then I realised the bash can't be fitted with the cranks installed, so I had to remove them and then fit it. Then I realised I couldn't fit it with the chainring on, so I had to remove that too. I then fitted the bash guard, but <laughs> I forgot to fit the chainring. It was a long day. The bash is called uh, an unused black spear granny god. What a good name. I wish there was some way to work out where it was made though. 
With the chain ring refitted, I can continue with the drivetrain and next up, the tensioner. So, okay, yeah, this is just an old mech, but this was pretty much what most trials riders used, either with a few gears or locked out with one. There wasn't much point getting anything too fancy as one missed side op could, and would, rip these right off, usually bending the arm at the same time. And speaking of locking them out, a handy trick was to remove the spring from the hanger bolt and add a couple of washers. This meant I could lock it in place on the hanger, reducing the noise it would make. As standard, it would swing and hit the frame when hopping, which made an absolute racket. This easy modification made riding so much nicer. The chain is the only item that isn't really period correct. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I give strict instructions to the cute thief that I don't like retro chains. They're either worn out or just a weaker design. And after snapping a chain around the era of this bike, which sent me straight to my plums and my stem, which then resulted in a hospital trip and a very intimate ultrasound scan, and then weeks of having grapefruits between my legs, I'm not exactly keen to replicate that retro experience again. You know what? I'm feeling indecisive again. I'm not saying I don't want to run this bar and stem, but let's weigh up the options now the bike is a little more complete. Up first, the X-Lite stem and the Zonic bar cook a combo. I like it. Still a little odd, but the bars look really cool. But I think the race face stem still beats it. With the bar fitted, this is a very nice looking setup. But I do have one more contender. An Azonic, not so, shorty stem. I wondered with its square design and redness, it might work well. The shorty stem was another popular choice for these bikes, and I think this almost works. It's just the reds don't match. If it was black or silver, I would be very tempted indeed. But as it stands, I'm still going to stick with the Brissa setup. But if you're vocal enough in the comments, I could be persuaded to change it to what you think looks best. With that interlude done, it's time to look at the rear brake. And as much as I prefer V-brakes, this frame does have dedicated Magura mounts. So I'm going to use this retro HS33 model. This is one of their better lever designs, as it was pretty strong. No modifications needed. The only real weak point was the TPA dial, which could break if used too much. This was cool to find too, a pair of heatsink yellow pads. These work well on smooth rims and the alloy backings help stiffen up the brakes. These were very popular, but it's quite hard to find these anymore. I did have to cut the material level as they were one pretty wonky. I've not done the best job, but they'll wear in. To use these brakes on this frame, I need to use these clamps. This makes the brakes a lot easier to set up, rather than using their adapters and V-brake mounts. I noticed this caliper had a slightly sticky piston though. Annoyingly, these aren't user serviceable, so the best I can really do for now is spraying on some silicon spray to help lube things up a little. These brakes aren't quite the same red as the frame, but it's either these or brakeless, and as fun as that is, I'd rather have brakes on for now. To help stiffen the brake up a little, and maybe some old school fans out there too, I'm going to use this grey Magura booster. I can't quite tell what model this is from, but I like the vibe it's given off. I'm actually surprised how stiff the brake is now it's all fitted. Either the frame is stiffer than I thought, or the alloy pad backings and booster are really working well. Now despite the fork having V-brake mounts, I have a matching HS33 to go in the front instead. This means I have to deal with the Magura adapter, which admittedly is very clever and works well, but is a real test of patience to set up. I'm going to use standard, for the time, cool stop pads. These were Magura's softer pads, but being honest, are still pretty crap. I'll give them a try though. This brake also has a sticky piston, but it seems to sort itself out easy enough. Mm -hmm. 
Setting up the brake took a little while, as expected. There's lots of directions the pads want to point and lots of bolts that need to be tight, but not too tight, also whilst trying to keep things centered and lined up. <sighs> I don't want to have to do this too often. But the end result is a brake that actually feels really good. Everything is hitting nice and flat and it feels really positive. I think the red works well and I'm a fan of how the reversed front brake on the fork looks too. So far so good. But it's no good if I can't pedal it. These DMR pedals should do the trick. I'm not sure what model they are, it's normally moulded into the body. They could well be fakes. Either way, they fit the era of the build and should be pretty grippy. <laughs> They're definitely on the chunky side though. Nearly there. Now, I just need to tell you all about the seat clamp like I teased at near the start of the video. I mean, how does this work? There's no wedge system, nor is there any exposed frame to squish with a clamp. Well, you have to use their special clamp. I actually think this is a really clever system. Traditionally, you flex the frame to clamp around a seat post. This works, but it isn't the ideal solution as flexing aluminium eventually weakens it and it's not uncommon to find cracks in older frames around the seat clamp area. Instead, Pace swapped the exposed seat tube with their own clamp, which is then held in place with a single bolt. This eliminates flexing the frame and a potential weak spot. Like I said earlier, Pace seemed really good at coming up with clever little ideas like this. The other cool thing with it is, the top of the clamp has a little recess, so when I fit this shim, it fits totally flush. You'd never know it's there. So, with the exciting world of seat clamps behind us, let's look at the seat post that will clamp the seat. Okay, I have a confession. The cute thief actually got me a Thompson seat post for this build, but I may have possibly perhaps used that on my latest hex build. Maybe that's why CT is so grumpy. In its place is this Promax model from a previous build. Let me know if you can tell me which bike build video it's from. It's a cool post though. It's an inline model, which I think always looks nicer and I like the single bolt design too. Now, the chair is quite something. A Cellitalia Carbon SLR. I thought these things only existed in fairy tales. I've never seen one in person and it's stupidly light. It's also pretty sharp. I complained about the chair on my mountain bike being a bit sharp, but this is next level. Pray for my thighs. Saddle look preferences can vary wildly from person to person, but I personally really like the look of this saddle. It's low, sleek and mean. Just what you need. Okay, let's wrap this up with some hand pedals. Some retro ODI ruffians will do nicely. And I'm gonna do my usual trick of using the slipperiest spray I have in my cave to stick them on with. I mean, the can matches the color scheme perfectly, so I kinda have to use it, don't I? But yeah, like I've said in other build videos, I have no idea why GT85 works so well at sticking grips on, but believe me, it works wonders. I would say I'm done, but there's one final touch I think it needs. A brand new Pace chainstay protector. Now it's done. Only thing left to do is check things are tight and then check how it rides. Oh, but first, if you're interested in the weight, that back wheel has added a few grams as it's a slightly heavy 11.5 kilos. This is an old school bike with old school geo. Noticeably, it has longer chainstays than modern bikes, but it still manuals very nicely. That brake's a little grabby though. The front brake has a bit more modulation and was actually way better for stoppies than I expected.
and I also haven't felt a bike this nice at backwards manuals for ages. I'm not going to lie to you, you can notice the weight in the rear wheel, but this is what we all used to run back in the day, and it's amazing what you can get used to. I love it already. What a bloody cool bike. It feels very comfy with this bound stem too. It's a short bike, so a longer stem is appreciated. I will make a riding video on this, but at the same time, I'm a little scared. I honestly don't want to damage it in any way. It's just too nice. Not sure what's going on with the saddle angle though. I've probably sat down too hard with my fat ass. Let's get it sorted and tightened properly. That's much better. Surprisingly, I didn't notice the sharp edges in my test ride. Hopefully, it's out of the way enough not to hit it hard. There is one thing I don't like with this bike, however. Some fool laced the front wheel with the rim decals facing the wrong way. Who could have done such a thing? Even though I was so happy the day I could ditch my old heavy mech for a more modern, lighter system, there is something so cool about an old school mech and four bolt bash guard. Maybe we should make mechs cool again. But yeah, what do you think? Or more importantly, what does the cute thief think? Hopefully he's calmed down a bit now. So one more confession. Despite what he says, the cute thief didn't supply me all of this bike. In fact, the truth is, it was donated to me by a rider who's a fan of the channel. It was supplied as a full bike, but the cute thief did go hunting and some parts have been swapped out. I honestly can't believe the generosity shown by Peter to give me his pride and joy. It's been over a year since I met Peter and got the bike, so apologies for him for taking so long. The worry was that this is possibly the coolest bike I'll ever have on my channel, so it's only downhill from here. But yeah, thank you so, so much for giving me my ultimate dream bike. Also, a big thanks goes out to Craig Shrembry, who also has an excellent retro trials collection, including a museum spec pace trials bike, for supplying the fork decals. I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I did making it, and I'll see you next time. Cheers, bye bye.